Amen. Open your Bibles tonight. Praise the Lord. Deuteronomy. Chapter 1, verse 3. Sister Lulu, I love you. It's just a wonderful lady of God. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 3. I want to preach for just a little bit, the Lord willing, between me and the promised land. Between me and the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 3, and it came to pass in the 40th year. Remember how many years they had to march around the wilderness? 40 years. In the 40th year, in the 11th month, so there ain't much time left. On the first day of the month, Moses spake unto the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him to command unto them. Verse 4, after, everybody say after. After he had slain Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Hezbon, or Heshbon, however you want to say that, and Og, king of Bashan, you can be seated, which dwelt at Ashtaroth of Edrei, if you say that correctly, on this side of Jordan, in the land of Moab, began, began Moses to declare the law, saying, The Lord our God spake unto us in Horab, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. You made enough laps, he said. Let's go over to the promised land. But the Bible says, and this is somewhat often overlooked or not noticed in the reading of the passage, it says after, verse 4, after he had slain, Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan. There were two kings that were namely listed as, half, as needing to be or a prerequisite to or necessary to be removed before God would let them go over. Because the Bible says, after he had slain these two, in Psalms 135 and 10, the Bible says, Who smote great nations and slew mighty kings, Sahan, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. The Bible again names these two. And all the kingdoms of Canaan, those were the kings that were coming after they crossed the Jordan. But Sahan and Og were on this side of the Jordan. Are you with me so far? They had to kill, kill a bunch of Canaanites in their promised land. But before they ever got to their promised land, there were two Amorites, which are Canaanite descendants, two Amorite kings they had to take care of before they ever got over into the promised land. Amorite, the word Amorite is what these two kings were. Og and, and uh, Sihon were both Amorite kings. And the word Amorite means publicity. It means prominence. Those are two good words for flesh. Flesh likes to be number one. Your flesh wants publicity and it wants prominence because pride shows up in a lot of ways. Pride shows up screaming to the top of its voice, look at me. And pride shows up keeping his voice quiet and walking around quietly saying, look at me, but we all got pride issues. And the Lord said, before you can go into the promised land, you're going to have to take care of some Amorites. You're going to have to take care of some flesh issues in your life. And those Amorites were publicity and prominence, thus a mountaineer. And they were one. They were two of the Canaanitish tribes, and so I want to look at these two tribes tonight very briefly. Israel had to face these two Amorite 
giant kings. Go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 1, 2, and 3. You will find out these were both giants in those days. These were extremely tall nations and large nations. Could I tell you tonight, your flesh is a giant. You've never met a devil bigger than your flesh. Brother Jeff Arnold said, God didn't make a devil bigger than me. The devil ain't never caused me more trouble than I've caused myself. We blame the devil for a lot of stuff that's really our flesh. If we ever get our flesh under subjection, we won't have any trouble with the devil. Jesus said the devil can't tempt me because he can find nothing in me to tempt. What he was saying was, I don't have a flesh problem, and if I don't got a flesh problem, he ain't got nothing to tempt me with. They had to face these two Amorite giants, these two uh, people of publicity and prominence, which is what the flesh is. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, God had destroyed many giants and many giant nations. If you read Deuteronomy 2 in your own time, you'll find that God had destroyed many giant nations for the Ammonites and the Moabites, and those were the descendants of Lot. And the Lord told the children of Israel, don't go over and try to get their stuff. I gave that to them. You leave them alone. You know, God can tell you what you can't have. He can also tell you what you can't have. If God can't tell you what you can't have, He's not really your Lord. If you just want a God that can tell you all the stuff you can have, that's not the God of the Bible. you got to want a God that will say, you can go through this door, but you can't go through that door. It's an amazing thing. The, the Apostle Paul said, that I would like to go to Asia, but the Spirit won't let me. Do you know there was lost people in Asia? who needed Jesus, but the Spirit said, you can't go. I'm not God. I don't know all the reasons why, but maybe later on, maybe at a different time, but the Lord said, that door's not open for you, so don't go there. we got to be sensitive enough to know when to open our mouth, but we also got to be sensitive to know when to shut our mouth. Our own flesh will get us in trouble. But there were two giant nations that came against them, Og and Shahan, and God had already defeated some other nations. If you read Deuteronomy 3, for the Ammonites and the Moabites, and those were the children of Lot, and even for the Edomites, who were the children of Esau, he had defeated giant nations for them and given them places and parcels of land. And I believe God had done this because he was trying to set the stage for his people. So they could look around and say, you know, these are giants, but if God can do it for them... He can do it for us. Could I tell you if God's ever healed cancer once, He can kill cancer anytime He wants to. If God's ever opened blind eyes for anybody, He can open blind eyes for everybody. Now it's the time for Israel to go and take their promised land. They've wandered around for 40 years in the wilderness, and now it's the time, but before they could go, they had to take care of these two Amorite kings, giant kings. And that was between them and the entering in of the promised land. First, I'll look at Sihon. Sihon the Amorite. Sihon, his name means tempestuous. Everybody say tempestuous. I want you to have as much trouble saying it as I did. Tempetuous, stormy. Tempetuous is an unruly spirit. That's what Sihon was to them. He was an unruly spirit. And in my eyes tonight, and what I'm preaching to you is they had to take care of some problems that was really inside of them. They had to look at some giants that were nothing more than a mere reflection of their own problems. And God said, before you go into the promised land, you're going to have to take care of some of your issues. Sihon was tempestuous, characterized by strong and turbulent or conflicting emotions. And he was an unruly spirit. To be unruly means to be unsubmitted. 
An unruly spirit is, is someone who refuses to be tamed and refuses to be controlled by God's Spirit. Did you know if you refuse for God to control you, He will not force His way? If you have an unruly spirit that says, I will not let God tell me anything, God will back off and leave you alone. And these Israelites had an unruly spirit in themselves for they had tried to go back to Egypt several times. They wanted to get rid of Moses and they, they were upset at everything that had happened. They had an unruly spirit and God said, I'm going to send you against what your problem is. You got an unruly spirit. You need to go fight this thing. Because the enemy is you. In Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 24, the Bible reads this way, Rise ye up and take your journey and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given unto thine hand Sihon, the king, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land, began to possess it and contend with him in battle, the Lord said. This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven. Who shall hear report of thee, and shall tremble, and be in anguish because of thee? Verse 26. And I sent messengers out of the wilderness of Kedemoth unto Sihon king of Heshbon with words of peace. You can't make peace with an unruly spirit. God didn't tell him to try to make peace, but he tried anyway. Some people have an unruly spirit. They're going to rebel against the pastor. They're going to rebel against the church. They're going to rebel against all authority because they have an unruly spirit. And you start preaching about their sins or you start preaching about their problems and they're just going to get mad and leave because they have an unruly spirit. They will not be ruled by the word or spirit of God. And that's why they cannot go into the promises of God. You're never going to get to get to Jericho and fight for the first promise of God if you don't first kill that unruly spirit. Somebody say praise the Lord. The Lord sent them against an unruly spirit first because that was their problem. They had an unruly spirit. And they tried to sue for peace. Verse 27, let me pass through thy land and I will go along the highway. I will neither turn to the right hand nor to the left. and Thou shalt sell me meat for money. I'm going to pay you money for it that I may eat and give me water for money. I'm going to pay you now that I may drink. Only I will pass through on my feet as the children of Esau which dwell in Seir and the Moabites, which dwell in Ar, did unto us. We passed through their lands, and we didn't cause them any problems. We just passed through, and we bought of their goods. They made money, and we passed right on through. We have a record of not breaking our word. Until I shall pass over Jordan into the land which the Lord our God giveth us. Verse 30. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. You ready? For the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. That was what Sihon was. He was a hardened spirit. He was an obstinate heart. He refused to let God work in his midst. Oh, it's a dangerous thing to have an unruly spirit. It's a dangerous thing to let God soften your heart. It's a dangerous thing to say, God, I'm not going to let you deal with me. They tried to sue for peace, but it didn't work. So God said, go in there and just wipe them all out. You cannot sue for peace with an unruly spirit. If you've got an unruly spirit, there ain't but one thing you can do with it, and that's kill it. you got to put to death your deeds of the flesh. you got to kill your old pride. you got to kill your anger. you got to kill your hate. You can't sue for peace. That's an unruly spirit. You're never going to get to the promised land. You'll never even get to Jericho. You'll never even cross Jordan and start to walk on some of the promises of God until first you kill Sihon. Sihon's an unruly spirit. 
Sihon was their first giant to conquer before they could have the promises of God. And people say, why can't we get the promises of God? You might want to go home and look in the mirror and say, Lord, if there's an unruly spirit in me, deal with me about it. Don't let me live with an unruly spirit. Because an unruly spirit is full of anger, it's full of bitterness, and it's full of strife. And when you hold an unruly spirit, it's like holding cancer in your body. It is killing you slowly. I want God to heal me. God may look and say, I'm not going to heal you because your problem is you. The only way God could heal you is to remove you. It'd be a whole lot easier if you removed you. If you would get your unruly spirit out of the way, then God could help you. God have mercy. Well, hallelujah anyhow. Anger and strife comes from an unruly spirit. Bitterness that eats away at your soul. But they don't even want peace. Because they have such turmoil within themselves. I've seen people like that. You're not going to talk them into peace. You're not going to counsel them into doing better. Uh-uh, they got an unruly spirit. You don't counsel an unruly spirit. You have to kill an unruly spirit. That's the only thing you can do with it. You don't give them a 12-week program on how to behave better. No, you say, get to the altar and kill that thing. Sahan had a reckless and tempestuous streak in him. Some of the synonyms or the, the allegories of a tempestuous person is turbulent and stormy. They're wild and they're heated. They're explosive and they're feverish and they're frenzied and they, they have a real short fuse. And I've been guilty of that. And I've had to repent because you know what? If I don't get that under control... I can't get into the promises of God. I don't get to have the promises of God because I pastor a church. No, I've got to take control of myself. I've got to get my unruly spirit under the submission of the Holy Ghost. Get my unruly spirit under the submission of the man of God and the Word of God. I've got to submit myself if I'm going to walk into the promises of God. Everybody say Heshbon. Heshbon. That's what they had to take first. They had to get old Sihon out of Heshbon. Them names are crazy, aren't they? Romans chapter 2 verse 8, Paul said, But unto them that are contentious. Contentious. Some people are just contentious. They just want to fight. They ain't got any desire to submit. There ain't a bone in their body that wants to submit. They'd rather stare down the preacher than anything else in the world. They have a contentious spirit. And that's what keeps them out of the peace and the love and the joy of the Holy Ghost. Paul said to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. So we can't help them. Just turn them over to it. They don't want peace with God. They want to be contentious with God. And there's a lot of people like that. Some people love to stir up strife. Some people love to sow discord. Some people love to tear down stuff. They're just contentious. They have a warring spirit about them. And that's what the children of Israel had in them. They had a warring spirit. They wanted to fight with Moses. They wanted to debate God. and They didn't want to submit. And so, so God said, listen, before you go into the promised land, I want you to go face yourself. I want you to go look at what you look like. you got a warring spirit in you that's warring against me. People with a warring spirit love attention. They do. They'll stir up trouble just so somebody will notice them. God's helping me with that. I've learned that the best way to stop that kind of stuff is don't give it attention. Amen. I learned this with my children. When they throw fits, if we just ignore them, they're over. 
five minutes go by and they're and now they're they really having to try hard because they're wore out. <laughs> and also they realize it ain't working. Listen, people that have a contentious and warring spirit that just want attention, don't give it to them. Go on and live for God. Get into the promised land. Listen, if you don't want to go to the promised land, uh, I'm still going. Amen. Do you want to fight against God? I'm still going to enjoy the blessings. I'm still going to drink the milk and honey. Well, praise God. They love attention. They like to be noticed. Israel had to defeat their Shihon John. The Bible says after they defeated him, then God said, now it's time to go into the promised land. Now that you got rid of that warring spirit. The Bible says in Proverbs 25 and 28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and wall and without walls. He has no defense. Proverbs 16, 32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit, than he that taketh the city. Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. The Bible says just get away from them. If all they want to do is argue and complain and fuss and cuss and carry on and throw fits, Listen, they're not going in the promised land. Be nice and be, be kind, but man, don't, don't miss the promised land. There's milk and honey over there. There's joy unspeakable and full of glory over there. Hey, I, I'll get over there and wave back with a big smile on my face and say, hey, if you get rid of that war and spirit, you can come over too. The next giant they had to come to after Sihon, which was tempestuous, their next giant before the promised land was Og. Og, the king of Bashan. And Og means round. Everybody say round. Now, at first thought, I thought well, he must have been fat. He was named round. But that's what he meant, was round. He was a giant and a king, and he was an Amorite. It comes from the root word gyrate. To gyrate means to do this. To go round and round and round and round. You know, if you gyrate, you never get anywhere. If you're up one day and down the next day and up the next day and down the next day and up the next day, you know, you're taking two steps forward and one step back or, or one step forward and two steps back. You're not getting anywhere. God said, you've learned how to gyrate. You've learned how to bounce like a yo-yo long enough. It's time for you to quit all this double-mindedness and this bouncing around. One day in, one day out. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Let me wait and see how I feel. That's a round. Just keeps going around like a, like a yo-yo. You're just on a merry-go-round. As long as the music plays, you just keep going around. Man, you're not getting nowhere. You're never going to get anywhere close to the promised land if you do that. Somewhere you got to just stand up and say, I'm going to the promised land. I'm getting rid of this old spirit of wandering. Og means round. He means to gyrate, which means to move or cause to move in a circle or spiral, and especially quickly. You ever seen somebody? They just... Listen, God looked at Israel and said, you folks have learned how to walk around the wilderness a long time. You're just gyrating. I got, I got to get you out of this up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down mentality. I got to get you out of this living for God out of feeling. I've got to get you to start living for God out of faith. Because if I don't get you out of this living for God out of feeling, you ain't going to ever get to the promised land. Somebody with me tonight? Amen. It's Og. He, he, he's a wandering spirit. You ever seen a wandering spirit? They, they can't stay at one thing very long. And they totally lose their focus. 
That's why they can't live for God very long because they can't keep their eyes on Jesus. I mean, the storm starts blowing and they quit looking at Jesus and look at the storm. Listen, if you look at the storm, you're going to sink. You can't look at your bills. You got to look at Jesus. You can't look at your sickness. You got to look at Jesus. You can't look at past hurts and who did you wrong. You got to look at Jesus. Because if you look at all that stuff, you're just going to be like a yo yo all your life. And you're going to look around and say, why does everybody else get the promised land? Why can't I have a right? Because you're yo yoing. You got a wandering spirit. This wandering spirit of Og. You got to stop looking around everywhere else and wondering, I wonder if the grass is greener over there. It probably is. The grass is always greener over a septic tank. You get over there and the devil will destroy you and destroy your home and destroy your life. And you'll have a lot of green grass to eat, though. Listen, we live in a generation of quit. That's what our generation ought to be called, the quitters. Because it's all about us. I'll do it as long as it's for me. Matter of fact, I'll do it as long as I like it. But as soon as I don't like it anymore, I'm out. Let me tell you something about Jesus. So since you're going to try to live for the Lord, you walk with Jesus, it's a good chance it won't be long before He's going to send you into a wilderness. It probably won't be long till somebody does you wrong. You're going to be singing that song, Somebody Done Me Wrong song. Because, see, if you live for Jesus, you got some rough edges he wants to knock off. And the only way he knows how to knock them off is get somebody to say something bad about you or get the pastor not to shake your hand or let somebody steal your car. Or somebody call you one of them holy rollers, or what are you doing, God? He said, I'm trying to get rid of that wandering spirit you got. Because you're looking for a good excuse to quit. So I'm going to give you every excuse I can so you can quit looking for a good excuse to quit. Hey, if you want to get out, God will help you. You think I'm kidding you? I'm not. He said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. He said, I would that you were hot or cold. He said, what he's saying was, I wish you'd make your mind up. Amen. But if you're going to get out, I'll help you. I, I, you got to get rid of that wandering spirit. You got to get your eyes on Jesus and say, come, come hell or high water, I'm not leaving. If they foreclose on my house, if my kid gets sick, if I get a bad report, I'm going to live for Jesus. You got to dig your boots in and stay the path. Because you keep running around in circles, you ain't going to ever get to the promised land. I see people at work sometimes. Man, I wish I had me a severance, and I wish I, I had, wish I had me some tenure and some seniority. You know how you get that? Stay with it. Man, I wish I had me some gifts. Uh, I wish I had me some power. I wish I had me. Just stay with it. You got giftings and callings and abilities, but God's waiting on you to quit wavering. God can't use anybody that wavers. God loves you if you waver, but you got to stay strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And Paul said, having done all to stand, stand. No, you didn't get that. He said, having done all to stand. Just stand. Don't leave. Don't quit. Don't give up. You got to be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Yeah. Yeah. 
who bringeth forth her fruit in her season. But if you go uproot yourself, you ain't going to ever have no fruit. So God sent them against Og, king of Bashan. That round or that gyrating spirit. Boom, 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 boom. Never going to get nowhere with a wandering spirit. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11. The Bible says this in Deuteronomy 3 and 11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. And it's talking about the Amorite giants who were on this side of the Jordan because on that side of the Jordan there wasn't nothing but giants. But only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the giants. The last spirit they had to get rid of in themselves was a wandering spirit. So can, can I kind of try to break it down just a little bit more? They had to quit from wandering to wandering. They had to quit wandering. Am I going to live for God today? I wonder if I'm going to put God first today. I wonder what I'm going to let sidetrack me. you got to quit wandering. Because if you're wandering, you're probably wandering. But they had to kill old Og, that wandering spirit, king of Bashan. He's the only one left. And behold, his bedstead. Of all the great battles King Og won, the Bible only tells us about his bed. His bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabba of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it. Now, some say that's 13 foot long and, and eight foot wide, and others say it's 18 foot tall and nine feet wide. That's, either way, it's pretty big. What are you saying that for, Pastor? Because that wandering spirit is a really big, big spirit. You can't negotiate with it. You've got to kill it. Verse 12. And this land which we possessed at that time from Aurora, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites, and the rest of Gilead, and all of Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto half the tribe of Manasseh, all the regions of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of the giants. So, they couldn't just kill one giant, because you've got to understand, a wandering spirit comes with a lot of helpers. Og was just the front man, but he had a lot of wandering giants with him. So when you get rid of that wandering spirit, look out. Another one's going to show up and say, come on, let us back in. Come on, man. We, we had a good time together. Come on, we had some good pity parties, remember? <laughs> I made you feel good about how bad everything was. Don't you remember? We celebrated. We popped some Mountain Dew open, got some Doritos, and man, we cried ourselves a river. It better be Mountain Dew. Or you got another spirit. Hallelujah. Coffee will work. It can be coffee. Y'all ever heard that song, Cry Me a River? That's what a wandering spirit does for you. You're always wandering. <laughs> Maybe it's better back in Egypt. I didn't know the devil was going to attack me like this. <laughs> I didn't know God was going to expect so much from me. Maybe I'd be better off back in Egypt. Maybe I ought to just quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Just stay the path. Stay the path. Because y'all know how to eat an elephant, don't you? 
one bite at a time. I remember when I first, and this is totally off the nose, but I remember when I first started college, I, the task ahead of me was monumentous. But I just, one test at a time. And there came a day when I graduated. There's a lot of similarities in that in living with for God. The devil's going to test you tomorrow. Just pass that test. Don't wander off the path when that test comes. You just say, you know what? Everybody may not like me, and I may not get what I want, and I might get persecuted for his name's sake, but uh, I'm going to stay the path. I'm not going to wander anywhere. I'm not going to the right, and I'm not going to the left. I'm just going to stay the path. Because if I don't get rid of this wandering spirit, there's one thing I'll never get to do. I will never get to enjoy the promised land. The Israelites had to confront and defeat their wandering spirit round and round and round and round. Ephesians 4 and 14, Paul said that henceforth we be no more children tossed to and fro, just bouncing around, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, to get solid and steadfast in Him. The Bible says if we ask anything wavering, be sure we won't get it. If we pray like a ping pong ball, you're not getting nothing. If you live for your life for God like a ping pong ball, you're not getting nothing. You got to stay. You got to put your hand to the plow and you got to be ready to do whatever is needed. Before we can have the promises of God, we must defeat, just like Israel did. We got to defeat, number one, our tempestuous, our, our warring, or our unruly spirit. And number two, we've got to defeat our unfaithful and our wandering spirit because either one of them that's working in our life and God will say you're, you're not ready to cross the Jordan you got too many problems in you I need I need you to fight you first if you can ever get the victory over you then you might be able to have the victory over the enemy There were some more giants later on. Goliath, he was the giant of intimidation. Send me a man to fight! All he did was try to intimidate. That's what giants do. They're intimidation. But you got to be able to identify the enemy. If you're going to defeat the enemy, you got to know who's shooting at you. And you got to be sure you know who the enemy is so you don't shoot the wrong people. Because if you're not careful, the devil will convince you the preacher's the enemy. The devil will convince you the Word of God's the enemy. Walt Kelly wrote a cartoon, Pogo. He said this, we have met the enemy. You could probably finish it. And he is us. We have met the enemy. And he is is us. I think Israel walked up that day and they said, look at there. There's a tempestuous spirit. That looks like us. We war with Moses. We war with the things God wants. We're mad because we're not getting all the stuff on the menu we want right now. We're not okay with just having manna from heaven. No, no, no. We want a lot more than just that. We're, we're not content. The Bible says, therefore, having food and raiment, let us be content. But we've met the enemy, folks. He's us. See, in the kingdom of God, there's nothing the world can do to stop you. 
The only one that can stop you in the kingdom of God is you. And FDR's first inaugural address after becoming president, he said these words, We have nothing to fear, but fear itself. You know what stops you from living in the joy of the Lord? And stops you from being a soul winner? And stops you from enjoying the presence of God? Fear. Fear itself. The greatest enemy we have to living in victory and to defeating fear and to being a soul winner and being an overcomer, our greatest enemy is always us. We like to blame the devil or even God, but the real problem is us. It's our warring spirit. I will not be submitted. I will not let anyone rule me. I will follow God as long as He tells me what I want to hear. And the other spirit is wandering. God can't keep us in the straight and narrow. We just wander, wander, wander. From emotion to feelings, emotions to feelings, up and down, up and down. The pastor looks and says, oh, if you could just stay straight. Because I don't know if you understand this. Now, let me try to illustrate it. The, the shortest, they taught me this in school. This is, this is going to be deep now. You ready? The shortest distance between A and B, straight line. If you want to make it hard to get there, just do this. How am I ever going to get there? What am I doing? I'm just wandering around, trying to get over there. I don't know if I'll ever get there. Let me go over this way and just wander here and wander there and knock stuff over and almost get there and come back over here and you just... You could just stay straight. Let's stand. Philippians chapter 1, verse 28. The Apostle Paul says this, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries is to them an evident token of perdition or destruction, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. See, when, when, when you cannot be terrified by the enemy, and when persecution can't stop you, then there's nothing that can stop you. What are you saying, Pastor? The battle's with you. Amen. It's not God. It's us. We have met the enemy and he is us. It's our fears. It's our inhibitions. It's our lack of faithfulness. It's our warring spirit that stops us from entering into the promises of God. God wants to give it to us. But he's going to make us face ourselves first. And if we refuse to take care of ourselves, you're not going to get any of the promises of God. Why don't we come tonight and gather around the altar?